Welcome to episode 12 of Kiki's Guide to Training Your Human. My name is Kim Lahofsky. And I'm Carly Philbin. And this is a special edition of Kiki's Guide to Training Your Human, Kiki's Vacation at the Beach. We are guest hosts for Ken Van Camp, who's on vacation this episode, and we're narrating this podcast under the creative direction of Kiki. In each episode, Kiki presents a dog's perspective on life and growing up in the human world. In this episode, Kiki has a visit from her beau, Fozzie, and she has lots of funny, interesting tales to share about her first road trip and her first vacation at the beach. On the road trip, Kiki teaches us how to avoid boredom and loneliness while spending 563 hours riding in the car's back seat. Along the way, she teaches her humans some new travel games to break up the monotony, like strip poker and find the puppy. At the beach, Kiki meets Wallace, a Swiss mountain dog who bears a resemblance to the Budweiser Clydesdales and is roughly the same size. She discovers the beach and relates her tale of getting rescued by Kim from her first exciting dip in the pool and climbing the nearest ladder in the hot tub, also known as Cousin Carly. I hope you enjoy this episode as we start with... Lesson 36. A Visit from Fozzie. Chaperone? Who needs a chaperone? It's a dull day in our house. The same old, same old. Can we go for a walk? What do you mean we just got back from one? What does that have to do with anything? What's that you say? Fozzie is coming to visit? That 25 pounds of fun-loving golden doodle puppy? He's coming to my house? Finally, I have a friend to play with. Finally, the drought is over. I rush to greet him at the door, but he's already in. He's two heads taller than me, but I jump, and he jumps, and then we wrestle. He steps on me, his 25 pounds to my four, and I howl. It's like the dog park all over again. Too many paws. Give me some space. So I lie on my back and tap out. Let me catch my breath. Fozzie backs off, sniffs me more gently to check for injuries, then nudges me to get up and play some more. I roll over on my belly, and he jumps on me. He still wants to play, but is not quite as rough this time. He's more careful, so he doesn't step on me. What's that he's saying? Sweet things. Let's find a quiet place to play alone. Oh, no, says Mommy, and Daddy pulls him away from me. Wait, we were playing. He didn't mean to step on me earlier. It's okay. He hasn't been fixed, says Mommy. Wait, what's broken? He seems fine, but they are telling Fozzie to calm down, boy, take a time out. But he wasn't mean to me, honest. Then it occurs to me, I've seen things like this on Gray's Anatomy. Maybe he's got a problem with his heart, and he needs to rest it until the doctors can fix it. No problem. We can play more later after he's rested. And he's a smart dog. He gets it, and he settles down. A little while later, they allow him back, but they're insisting I stay in Mommy's lap. What's a chaperone? And Fozzie kisses me and says he's sorry if he hurt me. He's very sweet, and I tell him it's okay. I know he didn't mean to. Can we play some more? And I'm out of Mommy's lap before she can grab me, and Fozzie jumps on me, and we wrestle some more, and he steps on me. Ow! Get off me, you clumsy brute! And another paw steps on me. Ow! Ow! Get him off me, Mommy! He's a brute! I hate him! Get him out of my house! Daddy pulls him away, and Mommy picks me up and comforts me. Out you go, Daddy says. He snaps on the leash and leads him to the front door. Fozzie looks back at me and whimpers as he leaves. Mommy says, are you okay? And she rubs my hurt spots gently. Moms always know how to make things better. But where's Fozzie? I didn't mean it. Do you really have to leave so soon? Lesson 37. Kiki's Vacation at the Beach it's more fun for everyone when one of them sits in the back with you. I got very nervous the day before my first road trip. Suitcases were filled and frenzied plans were discussed. 
I was assured these plans included me and would be a fun trip and a chance to visit unmet relatives, including three puppies. I was skeptical, remembering the trip to the vet, which had been described in similarly glowing terms but was a big letdown. Humans exaggerate the fun factor when they want you to try something they know you won't like, like Brussels sprouts, seafood, or rectal thermometers. It might be fun to watch a French poodle undergo a trip to the vet, but would you ever wish it upon a cute little beaver terrier puppy? But back to the road trip preparations. I was concerned when I saw my crate, stuffed with all my worldly possessions, move to the back of the car along with the luggage. Was the beach some sort of code name, like the dreaded puppy camp that was discussed in hushed tones by other dogs? There was nothing to do but wait and see, since I wasn't given a vote in any trip planning. I was also presented with a new bed, discussed enthusiastically as the ultimate in road trip comfort. I was encouraged to try it out, and when I hesitated, Mommy and Daddy took turns trying to curl up in it. Obviously impossible, given the vast size differentials. It was like trying to convince me I would love the taste of the heartworm pill that they buried in a slice of my favorite roast beef, sufficiently overacted to arouse suspicions. However, the bed was comfortable and a significant improvement over the previous blanket spread on the back seat. There was still the seat belt to contend with, but at least I could be strangled in comfort. The following day, the last of the luggage, travel food, and yours truly were loaded in the remaining cracks and crevices between the seats, and we set off with enough supplies to endure a Lewis and Clark cross-country expedition. As we set off to the melodic strains of Google Maps, I heard discussions about the length of the trip, an epic 12-hour drive, which would be undertaken over two days to allow for sufficient pee breaks, wrong turns, and temper tantrums. As we pulled out of the driveway, I inquired whether we were there yet and invoked the agreed-upon pee break warning. This led to a discussion about who had last taken me for a walk. After agreeing neither had, they further agreed to see if I could hold it until we were at least five miles from home. Having yet to receive an answer to my previous inquiry, I repeated my question regarding our proximity to the destination. Eventually, three miles into the trip, they pulled over for a bathroom break. I didn't really need to go, but since anxieties were high, I found it within myself to dribble a teaspoon of pee-pee to help decrease tensions. Back in the car, I was told to sit quietly so we could put miles behind us. I agreed and waited at least five minutes before inquiring about our current map position. The back seat was lonely and boring while they sat up front. Why should they get all the company while I sat alone? It seemed unfair. It took a few more polite questions before I felt ignored and was forced to resort to more urgent pleadings to get my point across. After an hour of this back and forth, or perhaps ten minutes, they pulled over and decided one of them would ride with me. The lesson here is to induce fear into the hearts of your subjects. Not fear of physical harm, but fear of the repercussions of leaving you alone. Constant whimpering and barking can make a ten-minute trip feel like ten days. And everyone had to agree that sitting in the back with me was much more enjoyable for all. We were able to play fun games like pat-a-cake, tug, and strip poker. I lost the first hand, which led to losing my only article of clothing, my harness. Since my harness is what keeps me in my bed, this led to another fun game. Where's the puppy? Stay tuned for part two of Kiki's Vacation at the Beach. Lesson 38. Kiki's Vacation at the Beach, Part 2. Swim, Kiki, swim. Okay, so you know I like attention. Constant attention. Well, in part one of Kiki's vacation at the beach, I showed you a little of how I coerced my humans into giving it to me. So, after two days, approximately 563 hours, of driving, we reached our destination. One of us was relaxed and the other two were badly in need of a vacation, which was what we came here for, right? I just helped prepare them for it. 
Our destination was a giant house on the outer banks of North Carolina with enough rooms to accommodate the entire Kardashian family and their spanks. The house was appropriately named White Water Winds, all of which were in abundance that week. There were more stairs than I'd ever seen before. One, two, three, four, 134, 135, 136. And that was to reach the summit. Upon opening the front door, another wall of stairs promised to take us to the mountain peak. 137, 138, 139, 531, 532, 533. The peak was populated with people, dogs, and children. A Swiss mountain dog named Wallace greeted me. He bore a close resemblance to the Budweiser Clydesdales and was roughly the same size. I expected to see a barrel of whiskey strapped to his neck. Instead, I was met by a giant tongue and massive nose that licked and sniffed everything that entered his mountain domain. It was some kind of rite of passage, so I closed my eyes and waited for him to complete his inspection. Finally, I was declared drug-free and allowed to pass. There were two other dogs at the mountain retreat, an old black lab named Hank who seemed to give me only a disinterested sniff, and a younger black lab named Logan, who was more territorial. I was urged to avoid him, which I initially did, until I found out he had been warned to avoid me. So I followed him around and he tried to get away, and I tried to keep up. Have you ever seen a 45-pound Labrador Retriever chased by a 4-pound Beaver Terrier? It was tons of fun for all. Over the next two days, I grew to love Wallace, who was a gentle, good-hearted dog, who ate more food than the rest of the family combined, and was the official pre-rinse cycle for the dishwasher. When he took a drink of water, it sounded like Niagara Falls emptying into a toilet bowl. I kept close to him because he was an excellent protective barrier. Keeping track of his four paws was more manageable than tracking the 86 human feet threatening to step on me at every turn. The following day, Mommy and Daddy took me for a walk on the beach. The ocean's roar was so loud that I thought I was standing on the tarmac at an international airport. An ocean hurricane had passed a few days earlier, It produced enormous waves and dangerous riptides, so there was no playing in the ocean for this puppy. Instead, we returned to the house, where we found a group of grown-ups and kids playing in the pool. I use the word grown-ups liberally here, because although they looked like grown-ups, they were a boisterous crowd. I longed to join in the frivolities. I watched with jealousy as Joe threw little Tommy into the air and yelled, Belly flop! and Tommy screamed with delight. Me next, I thought, but it didn't dare to approach the rambunctious group, kicking up waves in the pool that were big enough to rival the ocean's swell. Finally, I got my chance. Everyone was out of the pool, with some talking in the nearby hot tub and Daddy watching from a nearby lounge chair. Mommy had left the pool area, so I seized the opportunity, ran to the poolside, and jumped. Belly flop, I yelled, then hit the water. It sounded like a lot more fun when Tommy did it. Suddenly, I was immersed in deep, cold water and couldn't breathe. I looked down and watched as dolphins and loggerhead turtles swam below me. I had seen Logan swimming, so I knew dogs could swim, but I had never attempted it myself. Paddling hard, I managed to get my face to the surface and gasp for air. I wondered how long I could keep it up when I felt a friendly dolphin lift me from below. That's no dolphin. That's my sister Kim, who jumped in the pool and carried me to safety. I was shaking from the cold, and it was difficult to breathe. I heard Mom call from the deck above, put her in the hot tub to warm up and Kim handed me off to someone else. It was so warm. But wait, they want me to swim again, so I swam, straight for the nearest ladder, which was Cousin Carly. Her bathing suit had plenty of handholds, and before she knew it, I was out of the water and perched like a bicycle helmet on top of her head. 
she got the hint that I was more in favor of terra firma than terror fluid and moved to the tub's edge. She spent the next five minutes extricating and detangling my claws from her hair. Soon it was time to leave the beach and head home. We were hugging everyone goodbye when I realized Hank, Logan, and Wallace were not there. I made a break for it and counted the 533 stairs to the mountain retreat. Phew! But there was Wallace, waiting for me at the top of the stairs, and we said our tearful goodbyes. Mommy and Daddy finally found me and put me in the car. Wait, they're both sitting in the front and leaving me alone in the back. We covered this in my last lesson, remember? You can't leave me alone, and I will ensure you remember as soon as I... Close my eyes for a few minutes. Five minutes later, I opened my eyes and yelped, I'm all alone back here. Well, look at who finally woke up, Daddy said, looking back at me. Perfect timing. Perfect for what? I sniffed and found the familiar smells of home. We were pulling into our garage. Well, never mind. I guess they're off the hook this time. Thank you for listening to this episode of Kiki's Guide to Training Your Human. I'm Kim Lahofsky. And I'm Carly Philbin. And we hope you've enjoyed this performance. If so, please rate it and leave feedback. You can post feedback on our Facebook page or email Kiki. The addresses are in this episode description. We are dropping a new episode of Kiki's podcast every weekend on all major podcast apps. Make sure you follow Kiki's Guide so you'll be notified as each episode becomes available. So, what will happen next? Will Fozzie be allowed back? Will Kiki be able to force one of her humans to sit in the back seat with her every time they go on a trip? Be sure to join us for the next episode of Kiki's Guide to Training Your Human and find out. Because dogs are people too, you know?